Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Dead Man Walking Podcast. I am your host, Repeatedly Dead Fred, author of the medical trauma memoir, The Summer I Died 20 Times, which is what happened to me, and that's how I got the name. Today, I am very fortunate to have the past president of the Ontario Medical Association, Dr. Sohel Gandhi, uh, as our guest, and we're going to be talking healthcare. So, doctor, thank you so much for coming on. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Fred. So, as I mentioned in our little pre-chat, it's very difficult to get somebody of your stature, um, you know, and experience to come on a podcast and talk to the public. So we're very fortunate to have you. Um, so do you want to give the audience a little bit of a background of how you came to be uh, and your career track? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I'm not a new doctor by any stretch of the imagination. I think I'm considered a, a seasoned veteran. I uh, graduated from medical school in 1990 and uh, did a two-year residency in family medicine. And I really enjoyed rural medicine, so I moved to Stainer in uh, July of 1992, and I've been there ever since. Uh, so I've had a very stable practice. I work out of the hospital. Uh, and, you know, in that time, uh, when I first graduated, family doctors were expected to work in the emergency department, were expected to deliver babies. So I did all of that for 15, 16 years um, <laughs> and, you know, continue to work out of the hospital in Collingwood. Um, I've been interested in trying to improve the healthcare uh, needs of the community because I really like the community that I'm in. There, these are you know really good people in the Stainer, Collingwood, Wasaga Beach area. I think they're people who deserve uh, really good healthcare, as all Ontarians do. And I wanted to try and support them. So I was part of the primary care reform movement in the early 2000s. I brought in something called a family health group to our neck of the woods. Then I brought in something called a family health organization and as the founding chair of the family health team board. Uh, so I've always been involved a little bit in uh, trying to improve things for our community. And then in the mid uh, 2015, 2016 era, uh, where we had a government that for some reason decided they didn't really wanna listen to doctors. They thought they could fix healthcare without listening to doctors. Uh, I became involved in the Ontario Medical Association and uh, um, was not subtle in my criticism of that particular government, frankly, uh, and uh, eventually wound up as the president of the Ontario Medical Association. And that that's about a bit of a snapshot. Okay, it's quite interesting. Had your family been political or anything? No, not at oh, all. Not? Nope. So I'm a son of uh, immigrants, so uh, mm -hmm. they were just happy to be in Canada. Mm -hmm. So... I don't think most people realize, and I just learned this the other week talking with my psychiatrist, that our whole medical system is predicated on the family doctors being distribution hubs. And it seems that those positions are being de-emphasized and it has the domino effect on the rest of the system. Would you kind of agree with that? Yeah, well, so it's not our system. Uh, it's not just our system, I should say. If you look at high-functioning healthcare systems across the world, they all have one thing in common. So if you look at, you know, the higher-functioning healthcare systems in Europe, if you look at the parts of the United States, and I stress parts of the United States where healthcare works properly, because frankly, in many parts it doesn't there. Um, if you look at uh, even some... Uh, countries that one would not think of, such as uh, Estonia or uh, Romania or Turkey, um, the healthcare systems that function at a high level all have at their foundation fa family practice, right? So you see your family doctor, you develop an ongoing relationship with your family doctor, your family doctor knows you, um, if the situation is allows for it, knows your uh, your family as well, so understands the dynamics that they're and understands your healthcare needs and is able to provide you for you in what we call cradle to grave manner, right? So I look after babies, I look after teens, I look after adults, I look after seniors. Uh, so we provide cradle to grave care. Uh, and that kind of consistency, that kind of having that one point of contact has been shown uh, to be absolutely essential in order to have a high functioning healthcare system. Yeah, I think I'm very fortunate that I moved here from Winnipeg 
and my doctor in Winnipeg referred me to my family doctor here. They went to school together in Manitoba, but you know, he's like you, he's, he's been in the game for a long time and he knows everybody that I needed to be referred to. Mm -hmm. You know, if I needed a cardiologist, he knew it. If I needed a skin doctor, he knew it. And I think that's one of the great benefits of the family doctors is they can get you the resource you need. But having so many people now, I think you mentioned one of your articles. It says like two and a half million people in the province without a family doctor. That's insane. Yeah, yeah it, it, it is nuts. Um, and I would also point out, and this is also uh, something that's not thought of, very much, but is critically important to a high functioning healthcare system. You know, your family doctor oftentimes will know when not to refer, right? Because that's important too. You want to manage the resources properly. And there are many things that a, a competent, well-trained family physician can handle in their own office without referring. And there are many things that, a, you know, a competent, high functioning health uh, family physician can avoid unnecessary testing for. So that part's important too, and really needs to be emphasized. Uh, as far as the fact that we have two and a half million people without a family doctor, well, well, the blunt reality is the, the bureaucrats in the Ministry of Health have simply botched it. Uh, they have failed to recognize the importance of family medicine. Um, their main goal has been some absurd con uh, concept of, of cost control and containment and control of the system, as opposed to recognizing what's in the best healthcare needs of the individual. Um, and, and as a result of that, they've created a uh, sort of this morass of bureaucracy uh, that's, you know, disjointed, that's dis not integrated, that makes it very, very hard for family physicians to do their job. And as a result, we're losing uh, family physicians, people who have the training are choosing not to provide fa comprehensive family medicine care. Yeah, one of my schoolmates from Winnipeg uh, became a family doctor, and uh, he's also moved here, but he actually uh, gave up his practice, and now he works for like the Workers' Compensation Board and one of the insurance companies. Yeah, you know, does the northern visits because he makes more money in a much less stressful environment and mm -hmm. much less paperwork. I think from the probably 30 times I've been in the hospital over the last 15 years, I'm astounded by the amount of paperwork these poor people have to do. And nobody reads anything. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, very unfortunate. It, adds to the, it certainly adds to the workload. It takes time away from your family. Um, it is uh, not paid for, right? The 19 hours with men work, by and large, that family doctors do every week is not paid for. And uh, as a result, it, it drives people away. Uh, you know, a, a fun fact is that we have uh, approximately uh, 15,500 physicians in Ontario who are trained to be family doctors who could have a comprehensive care practice, um, but who have cho out of those, only about 9,500 have chosen to do so. So we already have 6,000 physicians that are already in Ontario, already licensed, already know how the Ontario healthcare system works. And if even a third of them could be, you know, could be convinced to go back into family medicine, if family medicine could be made more appealing, you'd fix this crisis, right? And you wouldn't have to do, so what, I mean, what the government is talking about now is, oh, you know, we have to look at other um, ways of expanding family medicine. Let's let pharmacists prescribe, oh, let's expand nurse practitioners. Let's look at foreign grads. You've got 6,000 doctors in Ontario already who can do this work. Make the job appealing, get a third of them to start doing it, right? And so no one looks at the simple solutions, which is really mind boggling. Well, consultants don't make money off the simple solutions. No, they definitely do not. So what do you think might be the like the top three things that would have to happen to make this more appealing to the one third of the 6,000? Yeah, so step one, uh, you know, would be we need to have an integrated medical record system, which we don't in Ontario. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, the biggest headache that I have is from my electronic medical record system. Uh, I will get, just, just to use uh, one example, one of many examples, I will get a notification 
on my EMR from a system called Hospital Report Manager, which gives me you know, electronic information on my patients. And that report will say, your patient X had a COVID swab. Okay, well, that's nice, but it won't mm -hmm. tell me the result. If I want the result, I then have to go through my chart, find that patient, use a separate login, go through a separate software, and find out when the swab was taken, and then look up the result, right? Well, it should all be automatic. It should be seamless. And that happens for, for multiple things. Uh, mm -hmm. So to, you need to sort of fix the EMR, and the only way to do it is to develop one patient app, only one, all right? Um, not right now, the government's thinking of having an open season and having as many patient apps as they're available, which is just dumb. You have one patient app, it sits on your phone, so it would sit on your phone, right? You would have access to all your health history. If you went to see a doctor, uh, you would say to the doctor, okay, here's the login. The doctor would automatically get all the information that they needed on you right then and there, right? Everything's seamless and integrated. And that's the way it's done in Estonia. That's the way it's done in Turkey, right? I mean, how can Estonia and Turkey do this and we can't in Ontario, right? And it would fix a whole bunch of the electronic headaches. Um, the second thing to do uh, is money. Um, that's just reality. Family doctors are spending 19 hours a week on administrative work, which is mostly unpaid. Uh, I don't think, I just don't think it's unreasonable to say, you know, if this is part of your job, you should get paid to do the work that's part of your job, right? Like if a, I don't know, if a TV reporter, for example, was told, okay, do, uh, you know, do a, a 30 minute segment on American politics or whatever, the reporter wouldn't get paid for just those 30 minutes. The reporter would get paid for the time he he or she had to do in researching the um, the broadcast and how much interviews he had to do and editing and all that stuff, right? So in much the same way, you need to pay family doctors for the admin work. And that's what they've done in British Columbia. That's what they've done in Manitoba. That's what they've done in Alberta now uh, and Saskatchewan. So I don't really understand why the, you know, the bureaucrats at the Ontario Ministry of Health are saying, oh, no, it's not a problem. Uh, you know, and, and the third thing that uh, has to be done is when we look at team-based care, which is something that can help and is used in high-functioning healthcare systems across the world, you know, the only work, the evidence is pretty clear, team-based care only works if the family physician is at the head of the team. And that, you know, does rub some people the wrong way because there are many other people who are in healthcare who think, oh, I can do this, I can do that. But the blunt reality is the evidence is completely clear that team-based care only works if you put the family doctor at the head of the team and you pay them a little bit to supervise that team. And so those would be my three things that need to be done. So if we go back to number two, which is the 19 hours of admin, if you had that magic app that consolidated everything, how many of those hours might possibly go away for the doctor to free them up to see other patients or to be honest, to golf more, you know, do whatever they want with that time. Yeah. Well, spend time with my family would be the time what mm -hmm. I would do because, you know, when I was on vacation um, in September, I went on a hiking trip with my son, with one of my mm -hmm. sons. And he pointed out to me that I was spending two hours a day on vacation uh, in front of the computer, looking up lab reports and stuff. Right. So um I would say at least 10 or 12 hours of that time would disappear mm -hmm. if you had that magic app. And then, of course, you'd have to pay 10 or 12 hours less, which is only fair, right? Um, mm -hmm. But, and I recognize that, uh, but the headache savings would be worth it. Yeah. How many, how many patients would the average family doctor see in a 10-hour span? Uh, so in a 10-hour span? Like if they know, just did a switch of, the time they're not doing reports to doing more actual patient care. Gotcha. So as a general rule, family doctors uh, would see approximately four patients an hour, uh, four comprehensive care patients an hour. If you have a, a walk-in situation where you're only dealing with one issue, you might see five or six patients in that time. Um, mm -hmm. but, you, know, you see right away that if you decrease my workload by 10 hours a week, I could actually spend more time with my family, which would make me happier, which is something I wouldn't deny is is obviously mm -hmm. interesting to me. Or, you know, 40 more patients in a week get seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I that, know. 
That adds up. Like my my visits to the family doctor because I'm such a complex case, you know, are rarely 15 minutes. But mm -hmm. I think most people are not my situation. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm sorry that you're such a complex patient. It makes it interesting for the doctors. I've had, you know, some uh, one-off surgeries. That, yeah. you know, um, but how how do you get this message into the government and get them to go 180 degrees and go towards the common sense? I think that, uh, unfortunately, it's no longer up to uh, physicians and it's no longer up to nurses. Uh, it's no longer up to pharmacists anymore. Uh, you know, the reality is that if you look at the associations that have been advocating for these individual professions over the past five years, they've been screaming at the top of their lungs. The OMA has been, the Ontario Medical Association, right, has been talking um, about the crisis in healthcare. The Canadian Medical Association has talked about that. The pharmacists have been talking about it. The nurses have been talking about it. The blunt reality is that, uh, the, you know, the government has not listened to these individual groups. And so, at, uh, you know, it's now up to the Canadian citizen. It's now up to the residents of Ontario, where we are, to say, you know what, we demand better. Uh, it's time for them to protest regularly in front of Queen's Park, not just once, but on an ongoing basis. Uh, to make it clear to the politicians that they have to enable this change in their bureaucracy. Because from what I've seen, all the healthcare profession agencies um, have done their job. They've tried their best and government just hasn't listened, right? Um, yeah. If you look at Newfoundland, and I'll use that as an example, uh, the uh, president of the Newfoundland Medical Association was sitting there saying, you know, the, the fishermen were up in arms about there was some change that was made to the Fisheries Act. I don't know the details, you know, and they protested. They shut down the Confederation building. And he said, OK, they have an important cause and no one's going to deny the fishermen their right to protest and how important that cause is. There are 100,000 people in Newfoundland, which is a very small province that doesn't have a family doctor. And he just said, well, how come no one's doing this over the medical crisis? Right. Uh, and, and I have to say, I'm, I'm starting to wonder the same thing, because at this point, that's the only thing I see that's going to change the government. Well, maybe people are too sick to protest. Perhaps, or maybe we're too complacent, or maybe Canadians are too nice. I, I don't know the, the answer to that. I just, uh, I've just come to the conclusion that, uh, that that's really what it's going to take at this point in time. Do the medical associations have professional lobbyists? Or yes. is it mostly just your body that, that does it? No, no, they're, they're professional lobbyists. I mean, they, they do hire lobbyists. Um, all of them do. Mm -hmm. They're just not the right type of lobbyist, I guess. You know, I, I don't know about other medical associations. The, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Ontario Medical Association, I know they've hired conservative lobbyists. They've hired liberal lobbyists. They've hired sort of independent strategists. It's not, mm -hmm. well, they've hired a bunch of different people from a variety of sources. Um, so I, I don't know what to tell you about that. I, 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 I don't know what it's going to take. And that's why I come back to, at the end of the day, the general public has to say no more, right? We're just not going to accept this healthcare system the way it is. Well, if there's anybody in the audience that's a community organizer, I think a lot of people would appreciate if you could get it in gear and start moving your people towards talking to the province about upping the healthcare. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree. So, um, are there parts of the healthcare system that are more urgently requiring transformation than others? Yeah, doesn't seem that way anymore. Uh, I think the only thing that seems to, to work is if someone is having a, a, an immediate heart attack, they seem to be able to get into, see a cardiologist for uh, invasive procedures relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. you know, but honestly, even cancer therapy is taking longer and longer. Uh, certainly orthopedic neuro, neurosurgical therapy is taking forever. 
Uh, mental health is just a nightmare um, from my point of view as a family physician. I, I can't get someone to see a psychiatrist for a year at times. Um, mm -hmm. So very, very little, I'd say. I think my psychiatrist also said she has like a one-year wait list. Mm -hmm. uh, it's tough. And orthopedics, um, another friend who's a doctor said he's also on like an eight-month uh, wait list to see a surgeon. Not to get the surgery, just to see the surgeon. That's correct, yeah. So. And, and this is why many Canadians uh, are starting to look outside. I, uh, you know, patients are traveling uh, outside of the country to get health care. Uh, <laughs> there's a story in um, the British Columbia newspaper, I think in the Vancouver Sun, about a lady who was diagnosed with cancer and wasn't given an appointment to see a surgeon or an oncologist, a cancer specialist, for three months. Uh, and she just said, well, I'll be dead by then. And she would have, she had a very aggressive cancer. So she went to the United States, um, spent $200,000 American, uh, is badly in debt, still alive, uh, and getting mm -hmm. treatment that isn't available here. Uh, and, you know, we're starting to hear st many more stories like that of people going to uh, Latin America. Uh, there are some parts of Latin America where you can get good care. Um, there are people who have relatives in some Eastern European countries that will go back and, uh, you know, Lithuania, Romania, you can get hip surgery next week. Uh, mm -hmm. Full disclosure, uh, I've already decided that if I, you know, God forbid, needed some uh, cancer therapy or, or major orthopedic therapy, uh, I've got some connections in Turkey and I would uh, I would just hop on a plane and fly to Turkey and I'd get the surgery next week. And it would be amazing. You know, it would probably be about 50 percent of the cost of going to the States. It would still cost mm -hmm. me. Um, uh, but I just. But you get to go to Turkey. Well, uh, Turkey is a beautiful country, um, but I've had a chance. But I just, you know, would not want to go through the healthcare system here. Not, it's not just the delays, um, mm -hmm. but it's the, the lack of um, resources for allied healthcare as well. So I was on call for my hospital uh, about six weekends ago and was talking to the nurses and they had all been assigned seven patients each. Now the, the standard for safe care in Canada is five patients per nurse, right? So the nurses, through no fault of their own, because of the shortage, they were all working 40% harder uh, and had a 40% higher workload than they should have had, right? And these are good nurses. And this is not to say anything about the nurses because they're excellent nurses in my hospital. I'm very proud to work with them. But if you take any individual and you constantly uh, say to them, well, you're always going to have to work 40% harder than you should, at some point, stuff's going to happen, Right. And at least I know that if I go to, you know, if I go to Turkey, the ratio there is actually one in one nurse for every four people, right? Or 3.75. So mm -hmm. getting allied health care as well as, uh, you know, care quickly for whatever I need. So it's those kind of things that are very frustrating and, and why people are choosing to leave. And I think the the load not on the, the nurses and the primary care people, but the load on the patients that have whatever is going on with them. And they're just sitting there not knowing what like the healthcare, the mental health aspects of that are a grind. Mm -hmm. It's just a grind. And it yeah, just I've... also dominoes down the road. Yeah, absolutely. Like it it wears people out and they get frustrated, they get tired, um, their mood goes down. Uh, you know, the most common, and this is this is true, the most common email because uh, I do allow my patients to securely email. Uh, but the most common email I get every uh, every week, if I list them by category, is, you know, you, you told me you'd referred me to a specialist. I haven't heard anything. Mm -hmm. That's the number one category of email that I get every week without fail. So is that just the specialist being overburdened or then just yeah. not being responsive? Yeah, it's a system problem, right? Uh, and it goes back to what I was saying. It doesn't matter how good you are, whether you're a nurse or a family doctor or a specialist. If you're constantly on an ongoing basis working 40% harder than you should, as these nurses were, and these were excellent mm -hmm. nurses, or 40% harder as some of the specialists are, or 
forty percent harder than some of the doctor as some of the family doctors are. At some point, you fry, your brain fries, um, you 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 reach a compassion deficit, unfortunately, because doctors, nurses, we're all human beings, right? We're not immune to this kind of stuff, um, and it it jades you, frankly. Uh, and I've seen that happen to many of my colleagues, and it's very very sad. I know a neurologist. She worked at uh, she went to med school at Columbia, and I guess the hospital there. She was a neurologist, like a, a surgeon, and she just burnt and stopped doing that to be a coach. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty drastic one eighty. Yeah, yeah, and I'm seeing that more and more, and I find that very very sad. Hmm. Well, doctor, this has been quite eye opening. Unfortunately, uh, I'll have to agree with you. The large, large majority of the nurses I've had have been simply outstanding under horrible conditions. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to, to show your gratitude. Like you leave the hospital, you buy the staff, you know, some pastry or something. Mm -hmm. But that really doesn't cover it. The uh, government has to do more. Absolutely. So thank you so much for speaking with me today. And, You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Uh, Thanks. Um, and for those of you in the audience, please like, subscribe, share, really share, share this a lot. because We need people speaking up about this issue. And we'll see you on the next episode of the Dead Man Walking podcast. Have a great day. Bye-bye.